Hello, I'm abyx 2 cam welcome back to the second channel video. Today I have some more Geography of Toy Cat Fuel. It's everyone's so second channel series where I talk about geography and the world and stuff. And today I have something that truly is a worldwide slash global issue, and it's something I'm a little bit offended about because people have been asking me to do this for a very long time, and it's like, you know what, just because I'm British, it doesn't mean I know everything about the British Empire, but it is something I do quite care about, actually, as it turns out, and it's something I've done a lot of research into and wanted to tell you about, because the British Empire still does sort of exist as of 2017. That's right, when you hear British Empire, Empire, you think the giant, you know, worldwide, quarter of the, you know, world's landmass, all of these things, you know, like the empire in which the sun never set, uh, the world's largest empire it's ever known, the superpower, etc, etc, etc. You think of this British Empire, but truth be told, even though the British Empire has gone a lot smaller, it's not just this island right here, it is something that, you know, truly is like a worldwide empire, it's just not called the British Empire, and it has a lot of weird layers and rules to it, and I figured, what better way to explain those weird layers and rules of the British Empire than with today's videos. Hopefully you all do enjoy it. Let's get straight into it. So let's start with a very brief explanation of like how the British Empire came to an end or like how it stopped being the giant empire it once was. Because of course, uh, again, uh, the British Empire, when it was at its big territorial peak, was the global power, like Pax Britannia. There was a, uh, the fact that there was such a big superpower kind of led to a world peak. You can argue whether that was a good thing or whether it was real, but it's a, you know, it's a thing that is generally acknowledged. And that's actually, you know, kind of cool, right? Like, oh yeah, British Empire, largest in the world. Doesn't that make you feel cool? But it kind of fell apart because, uh, you know, slowly as the British Empire Empire lost its significance in comparison to, you know, the United States and other world powers. Basically, uh, you know, the, uh, the the British Empire had to slowly give up its territories one by one by one, and this got even faster um, when, uh, you know, France, trying to hold on to its colonial possessions, had a giant war with Algeria, and, uh, you know, when you, hear, when you hear a colonial war, you think, you know, let's avoid that. So, yeah, as soon as uh, British colonies met some conditions, and uh, they wanted independence, they were granted independence, and one by one, over the 20th century, giant, you know, British colonies like Canada, Canada like India, etc., slowly, you know, faded out of the British Empire and into being their own independent countries. And that is why there is now a commonwealth of independent countries as opposed to a British Empire. However, uh, the, the big kind of end of the British Empire wasn't until 1997. That's when, you know, most people say that, oh yeah, that's the British Empire formally done because that's when Hong Kong, the last one of the really significant, like, overseas colonies, was finally passed from the British uh, back over to China. There's a long story on that one that, again, you can read about, in a, read about or watch in another video, but the long story on this is, like, that was the end of the British Empire because there was a giant handover ceremony and at that handover ceremony uh, Prince Charles, who will be King Charles one day, uh, said something like, oh yep the, British, uh, the sun has set on the British Empire but that's not true at all. The British Empire still existed in lots of different places and also the sun has not set on it and will not do so for hundreds of years but let's focus on the where it is right now bit because yeah there's a lot of parts of the British Empire that still remained even as of 1997 and they still exist to this day. They've just been renamed to British Overseas Territories and today I'm going to talk about not only those territories but also the other weird bits of the UK that don't really belong to it and that are kind of autonomous because again it's a really weird multi-stack empire that still exists today. So let's start with the most basic bit I guess which is the UK itself. The UK isn't actually one country like a lot of people think. There isn't just a Britain that rules the British Empire. There was a kingdom of uh, you know England and Wales and a kingdom of Scotland that fought, you know joined together and formed the kingdom yeah, again the Great Britain, British Empire, blah blah blah, blah all that sort of stuff and uh, yeah now it contains four countries. There is England, Scotland, Wales and either a country or a territory depending on which standard you're reading and which, you know, where you want to read about it, or if you're making a political statement, which is Northern Ireland. So yeah, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, Scotland, uh, they all have various degrees of autonomy, so they're not really all equal countries. Uh, you know, in some ways England's shafted, in some ways uh, Wales is shafted, in some ways uh, Scotland feels like it is shafted, and in a lot of weird ways, Northern Ireland has a bizarre situation going on. But yeah, that is what you need to know. There is uh, four countries of the UK, and these are the UK core countries itself. They're all part of the same like top tier of that system. Uh, the fourth tier of the system is really easy to stay because it's the Commonwealth. These are X. Um, you know, British Empire countries that get together and be friends, but they're not under control of the UK. So what's the second and the third layer? Well, they're kind of equal and separate in weird ways, and let's just start by explaining what I mean by that, because uh, the second layer is the crown colonies, or the crown possessions, or the crown territories. All three names apply in different places, but basically, yeah, they're, they're, there's a lot of places near the UK that aren't a part of the UK directly. You know, they're islands that are kind of self-governing, but they are officially part of the United Kingdom, and they're part of our country as a whole. So, yeah, there's three of these. The 
easiest one and the most well-known of them is perhaps the Isle of Man. This is one that's really funny to me because in school, you know, they would just skip over all the formalities of like how that worked. They'd be like, yep, that's part of the UK too. But it's not part of any of the four countries of the UK. And in fact, it's its whole own separate thing. It's got its whole separate country, uh, culture. It's the, uh, you know, the Manx culture. Uh, they've got their own separate political system and they even have their own separate currency. It's, you know, it's pegged to the pound. So it's one Manx pound is one uh, British pound, but still they have their own currency. There's a lot of weird separate things about them, but as far as the fence goes, as far as all these other things go, they are a part of the UK. And I think the easiest way to describe it is as an autonomous territory. So yeah, the history of it's kind of fascinating, but in brief, invaded by, you know, Vikings, Norwegians, and uh, they also owned a lot of the uh, islands around the UK. And it's just now that they're kind of like, limited to their own island over here. Again, very evenly split between England, Northern Ireland, and uh, Scotland. So there's a cool little thing right there, the Isle of Man, an uh, independent crown colony. There's two others of these, there is Jersey, Jersey is very popular with people that want to, uh, you know, go see some, you know, beautiful beaches and people who don't want to pay taxes. It's got a very nice mix of those two types of people. And uh, yeah, this is the second of the Crown Colonies. Same thing, unique little culture, as you can see, very, very close to France, but belongs to the UK anyway. And uh, also the most populated of the three Crown Colonies. Then we've got Guernsey over here, which is, uh, it, this is, a, again, there's more technicalities on this because there's layers of Guernsey because it's not just Guernsey, the island. It is the Ballywick of, Jerley, uh, of uh, Guernsey, sorry. So yeah, the Ballywick of, Jerley, uh, of Guernsey also contains the island of Sark, which there's a big controversy about how much power Sark gives to Guernsey. It's confusing, but just keep in mind, Sark is a part of the Ballywick too, and so is uh, the Alderney Island. So yeah, this is all like one separate territory in the Crown Territory stack, but that's that, that's just one layer of this sorted. Those are the Crown Territories. They're basically autonomous provinces within the United Kingdom. That's the easiest way to think about them. But then once you go further afield than just, you know, the UK, its territorial waters and this part of the world, there are also 14 others, or 16, depending on how you count them. There are 14 to 16 other territories around the world, which are under the you know, direct sovereignty of the British, uh, again, the British Empire is how I like to call it, but it's basically the UK now. Uh, this means that they do most of their stuff themselves, but a lot of their powers, again, depending on the territory, belong to the UK. So let's start in Europe because there are two parts of Europe that are part of the, again, they're British overseas territories. So their residents are British citizens and they basically have the same rights that British Empire citizens used to have back in the day because there is Gibraltar over here. So Gibraltar is probably one of the most, uh, it's probably the most controversial, I'd say, uh, no, maybe the second most controversial of the British overseas territories because it was won from Spain just over 300 years ago. And it's a big point of contention in British uh, Spanish relations. So basically, yeah, the, the Gibraltar is also interesting because it's the only um, territory which is within the uh, EU because again, look at that location. It's part of the English, uh, you know, it, it's, it's part, it, basically the Gibraltar border is the only point where England and Spain have a border. It's a very short border. And again, it's a big point of contention because it's such a valuable asset. The reason it's been held as a part of the British Empire is, and you know, people still want to be part of that is because when you control the island of Gibraltar or the Rock of Gibraltar, you also control the entire Gibraltar Strait, which is very, very valuable for global shipping and whatnot. So that's why they keep for their eye on it and that's why it's a very valuable thing. Uh, there's going to be way more contention with this in the future because you've got to keep in mind uh, that it, when there was an EU referendum, again Gibraltar are part of the EU as a part of the UK, uh, but the rest of the UK voted to leave and Gibraltar was like overwhelmingly in favor of staying. So it's not going to like actually cause like a giant you know crisis, but there is going to be some issues of like, wait, we're going to have an EU border right there. That's going to be awkward, right? And yeah, it's going to run into some issues, but for now, just keep in mind Gibraltar, the first of the territories and the most integrated, you could say, because they also use the British pound or the Gibraltar pound sometimes. Again, it's it's held at parity, but not quite. Currency is a confusing thing. Just keep in mind that Gibraltar is the first one. It's the most integrated and for the part for the purpose of EU statistics it is part of southwest england i mean not really there's a there's a big gap there right but Again, for the purpose of statistics, that's how it works. That is Gibraltar, the first territory of the UK. The second territory is uh, on the island of Cyprus. So Cyprus was a part of the British Empire until 1960. Then there were big agreements uh, between, the uh, yeah, again, the UK, Turkey, and Greece because they all had kind of like a, a say on the island. And now uh, the way it works instead is that there is a divide on the island between three separate countries, Cyprus, Northern Cyprus and the British, again, the British Overseas Territories. The British Overseas Territories were agreed when the country went independent. And the big reason for this is because they didn't want changing governments to affect their military bases, because this is a very, very valuable place for military bases. Again, that's that's how most of these work. Like, oh yeah, 
Britain wants to keep its influence in the world, and it did so by keeping a hold on the, again, it's a, it's a coach, <laughs> I, I, I'm terrible at the pronunciations, but it's a, a, a Akrotori, and there is Dekelia, I believe. So yeah, there's the two um, British, again, British overseas territories that exist over here. They're in very weird places, and they mostly exist as military bases. Lots of people also live there, though, to support the military bases, and some Cyprus people, or Cypriots, also live on the islands. This island's very controversial, so I'm trying to try and stay away from the rest, but basically, it's divided between two people. One of those claims is more legitimate than the other, but how you see that is how you see the world. And I'm gonna avoid that, but just keep in mind that Britain also has its own little place in the island where it's like, yep, we're just gonna leave our stuff here. Oh, one more thing. Uh, when, when you see airstrikes happen from the UK to say Syria, they're usually happening from uh, the parts of Cyprus as I understand it. So yeah, there is the second European British Empire territory, but we've got 12 more to go because the British Empire covers most of the world. So next up, we've got the British Indian Ocean Territory. So yeah, the British Indian Ocean Territory is a really fascinating one to me because I read up on it and there's not really too much going on this place. Like no real, not many people uh, apparently live there. They moved them all off the island. It was a big controversial thing. But the thing about this that made me go, wait, is that real? Is the fact that when, uh, so Brit uh, Britain, yeah, again, kept control of this after the empire kind of started falling apart. But the United States Pay, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, wanted some military bases there. So the, they agreed with the government of the time to have military bases, and now it's mostly a US island. And in exchange, they gave us discounted nuclear weapons. Like, it wasn't even just like free nuclear weapons or like lots of money. It was like, here, have a discount on these nuclear, I think it was nuclear submarines actually. But still, it just seems weird to me that like, oh yeah, we gave up some territory for bases for nuclear submarines? Okay then, that's a, that's a weird little agreement. And that is the British Indian Ocean Territory. The one with the most bland name of all of them, like really? It's in the Indian Ocean and it's owned by the British Empire, so it's, or it's territory of the British Empire, so it's the British Indian Ocean Territory. C could we not do better? Could we not give it a catchy little name like the, the harp-shaped island or something? But no, it's the British Indian Ocean Territory. And that's just that, I guess. So yeah, that is the third territory. Nice and easy because it's just in, randomly in the middle of the ocean and it's used for military bases one more time. So off the subject of military bases, let's move to the Caribbean where six of the territory is located. So we'll kind of speed through these ones because we've got the Bermuda, which I think most people know where they know it. It's uh, very well known for insurance, tourism, and also the Bermuda Triangle. So the Bermuda Triangle is roughly, um, you know, Bermuda, Miami, and Puerto Rico. And this triangle is known for having so many accidents, Ooh. but no, in all seriousness, no, uh, the Bermuda Triangle is like really spooky for a lot of people, but the vast majority of those accidents, when you read into those, either it's like, oh yeah, they were novice pilots flying in a storm without enough fuel to get home. I wonder how they crashed, or it's like, oh yeah, a boat crashed, except there's no record of the boat ever existing, and we just kind of claimed it crashed. It's, it's all kind of crazy stories like that. Why the stories came about, I think is an interesting thing by itself. But if you think there is a spooky part of sea where like a kraken will kill you, it's not really the case because lots of boats and lots of uh, planes fly over that to this day. And most of them, in fact, almost all of them do not go missing. But if you want to believe, go there in a paddling boat and go find the kraken. Uh, it's a thing you could try and do, but that's the Bermuda Triangle based or named after Bermuda, which is again, a very remote territory that's like quite far away from the rest of the Caribbean uh, because next up, we've got the Turks and the Caicos Islands. So the, uh, these islands are quite unique because they're one of the two British territories to use the US dollar officially. Again, it's a part of the British Empire that used the US dollar, kind of bizarre. And their capital is Cockburn Town. That's right, Cockburn Town. That is a, it's a lovely capital. So with that said, let's move. <laughs> Let's move on to the third, um, you know, British territory inside the uh, the Caribbean. It is the Cayman Islands. So these islands are also very well known for being a great place to keep your tax dollars hidden and uh, well, tax. Uh, I guess yeah, they use the Cayman Island dollar, but the tax your tax money hidden away because that's a thing. And they also have some really lovely named places such as my favorite Rum Point and Rum Point Beach. That's a thing you can go to. So yeah, Cayman Islands, a lovely, another lovely tourist destination where you can also hide some money if you want to. So yeah, as well as how these three, we've got three more. We've got the British Virgin Islands, which again, this is one of those things where it's very widely believed that they're named after British, Richard Branson because, oh, British and Virgin, that's Richard Branson, right? Uh, no, uh, these are just, you know, there are Virgin Islands, there are three types, there are Spanish, there are American, and there are British Virgin Islands. And by the way, the border between those, if you look, is one of the like, only points on Google where they'll draw a thing in the sea, just to make it clear. 
But yeah, staying on track. Uh, the British Virgin Islands are just islands owned by the, uh, again, they used to be just the Virgin Islands, but then the US got some, so they had to be called the British Virgin Islands. And uh, however, the thing about the Virgin founder, I thought it wasn't true that he owned them, but he actually owns one of them. It's it's not the reason they're named the Virgin Islands. It was just a really happy coincidence. He owns, oh, sorry, he owns two now, because uh, he bought another one. Uh, he owns, uh, Necker Island was the famous Richard Branson Island. And there's actually a cool story about this because it was worth six million. Like the whole island was for sale. It was worth six million. He went there, did a tour, and then put in a bit of like 100,000 and they turned him down like made him leave immediately but they actually did settle later for like 180,000 so he got a 6 million island for 180,000 and that is Necker Island one of the more famous islands in the world we've also got Mosquito Island just over here which is the second island owned by him and just in case you're like oh it's the British Virgin Islands and it's a British man and it's virgin and he owns the island those are the islands you need to care about. But it's also a fully functioning country in its own self. Uh, over 28,000 people live there, and they're the second current, uh, country to use the US dollar. There you go. There's your uh, British Virgin Island knowledge. So there is also Anguilla over, Ang Ang Anguilla over here, which is, uh, again, it's a very interesting territory because it was a point on the slave trade. So the vast majority of its citizens, over 91%, I believe, are actually, you know, are African descent, which... Again, very interesting, there's a part of the British Empire that is like, I mean, it's not the only part, but like, it's it, it's in the Caribbean too, so that is Anguilla right here, which also shares half an island with St. Kitts. Another fascinating place because it's the smallest territory in the Caribbean, so again, cool little fact about that. But uh, as well as that, we've got one more, which is of course, uh, just over here, Montserrat. I, I was like scrolling down, I was like, where's Montserrat? But yeah, here's Montserrat just over here. So Montserrat is really... I don't know if this is interesting or it's tragic, it depends on your viewpoint, but it is a volcano island and the volcano became active again just over 20 years ago. It erupted and uh, the entire capital at the time was destroyed. So this used to be a capital and not really so much anymore. But yeah, there's a giant exclusion zone on the island where you can't really go so much because there was a volcano and the island is repopulating again now, which is good news, but there was a volcano eruption on the entire territory of Montserrat. So that is another six in addition to the three we've gone through so far. What about the other five, Toy Cat? So again, it's five or seven, depending on how you count. Uh, the next one here is my favorite one because it's a... It, it may, uh, yeah, again, you might think like, oh, it's so we're on like the third tier of the British Empire and everything's on its own little level. How can things get more bizarre? Oh, wait, wait, sorry, one more thing around the Caribbean. So the Turks and Caicos Islands, um, they were the last territory to be direct ruled by the UK uh, because they had lots of government corruption. So the UK government, because they are officially in control, stepped in and said, no, stop that, held some fresh elections, and then they did it again. So in case you're curious, the British government do something for these people, you know, like directly as well as indirectly sometimes too. So yeah, as well as that, we have the 10th territory, which is St. Helena uh, Ascension and Tristian du Cunha. So this one is just confusing to me because three entirely separate, like look at the distance between them. This is uh, St. Helena. This is Ascension Island, and this is Tristan uh, du de, de Cahuna. Uh, de, de Cahuna, sorry, again, pronunciation all off the chain. But uh, off the chain? Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, these are all massively separated. Look at the distance between them, but they are together as one territory. Why is that the case? I mean, it depends on how you want to see things. But the cool thing about them being island states so far apart is the exclusive economic zone of their waters actually makes up something like, you know, like uh, it's it's almost like the vast it's almost the vast majority of the UK's territory and waters. And in fact, just because of these islands and then all the other things put together, the UK owns something like you know the fifth most uh, amount of water, like they can have fishing rights and stuff in, which is pretty darn cool, right? The fact that. Just some islands in the middle of the ocean, which don't have many people living there, you know, at all. It's a, a combined couple, a population of less than 20,000. But in spite of that, there's all of that sea that belongs to them because they're little islands in the middle of, uh, again, of the South Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, yeah, as well as just being like, oh, they're cool islands because of that. Uh, there's a couple of cool facts about them, such as St. Helena here is really well known for having Napoleon's uh, place of death and place of exile. So I'm not big enough into history to tell you why he had to be exiled instead of killed. But again, the uh, the, the European powers, after they took, uh, you know, they got rid of Napoleon and they sent him to this island here, the most remote island they could find. And uh, they, they sent him here and there's varying reports of whether he was poisoned or if he died naturally, but he spent the rest of his life here kind of separated from the world, which is a really weird thing to do with Napoleon. But that is a weird little fact about St. Helena. So the other two territories, there is Ascension Island just over here. So again, 
kind of a cool little place, uh, used for military stuff too. And then we've also got just to the south, the least populated of them all, which is Tristan du Cahuna. So, uh, de, de Cahuna. So, uh, yeah, the most populated, in fact, the only settlement in this third country within the British overseas country, which is a part of the UK, because, ah, uh, is the fact that uh, the only uh, the settlement here is Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. Funny name for a place, I think, but it's just known as the village locally. And uh, yeah, it has just over 200 people living there. Very, very tiny settlement uh, on this cute little mountain over here. And the thing I really love about this territory, though, is one of the other islands is literally called Inaccessible Island. There is an island that's like not properly, you know, accessible, and it's called the Inaccessible Island. I thought it maybe be a misnomer name, but nope, no one lives there and no one goes there because it's the inaccessible island. Isn't that perfect? I love it. I love it. So yeah, that is, um, there's also the 90 Gilards. There's lots of other islands, but they're not as, uh, you know, uh, populated as these three, which form one territory in and of themselves. So there's just four more to go now. Uh, the next one is again, another controversial one where someone's going to be from Argentina and take offense from this. But let me just say, I really don't have like this giant opinion on the Falkland Islands. I'm just going to repeat to you how it is generally known in the UK, and then how the, the, the you know, Argentina sees it. So, uh, as, as well as I could research, because I did a lot into this, and as far as I can tell, the Falkland Islands were settled at one point by a Spanish explorer, and uh, then, you know, the, the, the most, the actual, you know, claiming of them was done first by the UK, and uh, now it is basically a UK territory that exists very close to Argentina. So it's quite a valuable UK territory, and it was more so before the Panama Canal, because they have lots of ships can pass that want to, you know, restock and stuff, so they have, like, a very uh, a vibrant economy that works off of that, and military bases, and blah, 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 blah. But Argentina believes, because, I mean, look at the place of the UK, look at the place of Argentina, therefore it belongs to Argentina. And although the UK has said, Let's take it to the International Court of Justice. Let's hold a referendum. In fact, they held a referendum twice and they both went like 99% for staying in the British Empire. The Argentinas were like, no, let's, we'll have those. And they started a war with the UK over it, in fact, by like, you know, taking over the islands. Uh, and that war actually, it's funny because these, the Falkland Islands, you know, they're just a, uh, they're a territory with 3,000 people living there. It's a very small territory in comparison to the UK. But it, in spite of that fact, uh, they kind of entirely shifted the way uh, British politics went because, uh, you know, in, again, I, I want to stay all the way out of like politics and opinions of this sort of stuff, just tell you the facts on it. Uh, and, you know, rather than be like, oh, I really like these guys and they're awful. But the people in charge at the time, it was uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, the most famous UK Prime Minister, perhaps, uh, of the last 50 years. Uh, basically, Margaret Thatcher was in charge at the time and she was underneath in the polls to the Liberal SDP alliance, if I'm not mistaken. They were going to win like a massive landslide. Uh, they even had like a big thing of like prepare for government tomorrow and that was going to happen but just before the election the Falkland War happened and because the British Empire is so revered by British citizens like I feel like most empires don't have an approval rating as high as the British Empire within its own citizens like British people love the British Empire and the idea of it because it's cool we used to own so much of the world right and basically because of the uh, you know the war and the fact that she won it decisively and she was a strong leader that led to a giant increase in the polls that led to the third party you know that was going to be first going all the way down to third and losing it, it was a tragedy for everyone else involved and it led to the again this giant rule under uh, that one leader which is again depending on your point of view good bad or neither I guess so just so you know the Falkland Islands these uh, islands just next to Argentina have shifted British politics in this giant way, kind of by accident, honestly, which is fascinating if you ask me. So, as well as that, we've got the uh, slightly less interesting South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, which I love the name of, by the way. Uh, no permanent people live here. There is like a population of, when you measure it, like zero to 50. And uh, basically, yeah, the South Georgia Islands used to be part of the Falkland Islands too. They were part of that same war, but no one really cares as much because people don't live there and they're further away. But it was a, again, significant part of the world history and it is a British overseas territory where no one officially lives. But yeah, uh, also, yeah, they've only been their own separate territory for like 30 years, but it's still kind of cool, right? They've got stuff going on there that you can go check out if you want to go to a uninhabited place. But the place you probably want to go instead is the British Antarctic Territory. So this one's also controversial. You know, I feel like the British are pretty good at being controversial, right? Uh, because the British Antarctic Territory is part of a continent which everyone has agreed not to claim, but also they kept their claims to anyway. Question mark, question mark, question mark. And uh, yeah, the British uh, overseas, uh, sorry, the British Antarctic Territory is the largest chunk of British territory anywhere in the world out of like, you know, 1.8 million square kilometers. 
of uh, British land, 1.78 or something like that, uh, again, million uh, square kilometers, goes to the British Antarctic Territory, and the exact dividing of it looks something like this. As you can see, Argentina disagree with uh, the UK's land size, and so do uh, Chile, they have their own little slices. Uh, however, every other country agrees with the UK, and it's, it's a mess because none of them should be able to claim it. I don't, again, it's, it's bizarre to me, but right now, you just need to keep in mind, there's some tensions with Antarctica, because, you know, why not, right? So, yeah, this is uh, the British Antarctic Territory, the largest of them all, no one permanently lives there, and there's no military population allowed, and there's lots of people that live there in the summer and the winter for research. That's Antarctica, now you know. So with that said, let's move on to the final one, because you might notice from 13, what's the 14th British Territory? What have I been, what have I been saving for last? And honestly, this is my favorite of all of them, because it just, it blows my mind that this even exists, because it is in the South Pacific Ocean. So again, we've gone all the way across the world, these territories, we've got two in Europe, we've got one in the Indian Ocean, uh, lots in the South Atlantic, some of the Caribbean, but this one over here is the most uh, confusing to me, so I'm gonna lose it if I don't look for it. There it is actually, the Pitcairn Islands. So the Pitcairn Islands are fascinating to me because they have uh, one settlement on the entire islands. It is, uh, it is Adamstown, just over here. And this settlement has less than 50 people living there. This entire country, uh, it's a country under British rule, but it, this, uh, it's, it's the smallest population of any self-governing you know, like, country-like unit. The Pitcairn Islands have less than 50 people living there, again, depending on when, how, etc. you measure it. There's like 49, 47, 50-something people. But that is fascinating to me that, like, one island in the middle of nowhere, bear in mind, like, this is the Pitcairn Islands, uh, actually has that number of people living there, and they have a roughly functioning economy. You can go and visit these places, except it's ridiculously tricky, because, again, bear in mind, even though it's a British overseas territory, that means they have the right to live anywhere else in the empire, but elsewhere in the empire don't have a right to live there or work there or anything like that. So to get there, you have to like speak in person to their immigration officer. Um, and but even to even get to that point where you're speaking to that person, what you have to do is you have to fly uh, to a separate island, fly from that island to an island 330 miles away, and then once a uh, again, and then once a month from that island, you can take a boat to the Pitcairn Islands, which is ridiculous. But some people do it. There is a genuine tourism sector in the Pitcairn Islands, which is part of their economy. Uh, but again, to me, the fact that there is a 49 person economy in the world blows my mind and what's even crazier is the fact that on this you know on this 49 uh, person economy uh, there are services that exist like one day a week like one day one guy is a baker and then on friday uh, friday he's a takeout guy uh, they again the five hours of electricity in the morning five hours in the afternoon. Um, the, the way everything works here is uh, pretty wacky, including the currency, because it's the only British, uh, part of the British, um, uh, again, the British, the UK, let's call it, the, uh, the, it's the only part of the British world which also uses the New Zealand dollar, because of course it does, like I guess, Look how close it is to New Zealand, why not New <laughs> Look how, wait, there, there we go. Look how close it is, let's just use their dollar. So yeah, New Zealand dollar on this ridiculously bizarre, ridiculously remote territory. And I think this kind of sums up the British Empire quite well. Like, it doesn't really exist in the same way where we own these giant swaths of land anymore, but there are lots of weird parts of the world that are under British rule and British control very indirectly. They get some benefits from that, they get some downsides, but that is the British Empire as of 2017. I hope you did all enjoy today's video. It, oh, it's almost like 30 minutes, but there's a lot of them, and I hope I explained something about all of them. If you did all enjoy it, wait, second channel. Uh, wait, wait, before I go though, there's something very important. Since I've been British, talking about the British Empire, and this has not even been playing for any of that. <laughs> I know, like I said, um, the British Empire is very highly revered amongst British people, very unique as far as I can tell amongst empires, and I honestly, I get it a little bit. So I hope you enjoyed the video, second channel, don't care, goodbye.